The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. There were some present at that very time who told Jesus of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered thus? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told them a parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. He said to the vine dresser, Lo, these three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Let it alone, sir, this year also, till I dig about it and put on manure. And if it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of your word, for the truth that is proclaimed, for the wisdom that is provided, for truly your thoughts and ways are far above ours. We would not begin to guess what your will is for our lives apart from that word. So We pray now that your spirit would guide us as our hearts and minds and our lives are turned toward you, and we hear your word. Help us to know your will through it, and by your spirit, give us strength to do it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> so I've been reading about the storms and the tornadoes and stuff in the Midwest. I mean, one, one response to that as we look at the devastation that's going on is simply to be thanking God that we live in Florida. Uh, we're in a, a place where that doesn't happen quite as often. But there could be other questions that are raised about this. Um, and it is uh, a theological uh, used word, and it's seldom uh, used by people. But I wonder if you're aware of it. It's called theodicy. Anybody know? Got a short definition of theodicy? Theodicy is the reflection on the question about how can bad things happen to uh, people who love God? How can a loving God allow these bad things to happen to them? The gospel lesson is replete with that kind of a question going on, and I expect that that has entered into our minds at various times in our lives. We look at the story, and the tornado is going down the street and it hops over a particular house. We want to know why that house was destroyed, why that family was so touched with death, and that one escaped it. There was a, a book written a long time ago by Thornton Wilder, and I don't even remember how I ended up reading it in school. And that was a fiction story, but it, it dealt with the question. It was called The Bridge of San Luis Rey. Anybody else read that? Yeah. Yeah. It was a real question about two villages in Peru that are across this great chasm, and there's a rope bridge that has been used for decades, people walking back and forth. Well, one day, that rope breaks. And as I remember it, it was six or eight people that fell to their deaths. And there was a monk there, and, and his... Um, you know, work then was to try to interpret for people living on both sides of this uh, chasm why they died. There were others who had just passed by. They didn't die. Is it just all fate? Is it chance? A flip of the coin? Well, we ought to be able to deal with that question more theologically than that because we're the children of God. We read the Word of God. We know that the author of life is God and that what He wants for us out of His thoughts is life. 
crucial gift of life. He is the author. And if we want to know what the meaning and the purpose of life and the end of life and beginning of life, if we want to know about life itself, then we need to hear from him. Much like some computer programmer who puts something in there for us on the screen that we automatically see every time we say command B, almost every time on a Mac, and you've selected something, it turns it bold. The programmer had something in mind why that would be easier than going through 12 steps, at least on the Mac it is. So what did God have in mind for us? I mean, when we came into the world, what did he have in mind for us to be about? What's the meaning and purpose of life when it could be cut short? And we hear Jesus describe that as well with these disasters that were happening in his day and age. We know some of the things Jesus described about life. Life is more than, can you complete that? It was from the Sermon on the Mount. Life is more than what you wear or what you eat. So Imelda Marcus, having 3,000 pairs of shoes doesn't change what God intended for you. What you might do for those uh, people, uh, the poor that are around you, instead of buying 3,000 pairs of shoes. Life is more than. Now there was a really extraordinary statement in the psalm. Uh, I, I got to read it. You got to hear it. Did you hear it? What it said is, it is better to have the love of God than to have life itself. Is there really something more valuable than life? I mean, how, how would we get to appreciate it if, if we're not here? I want to reflect for a while on, on how this works. <laughs> what is the understanding we have about life and death and purpose and meaning for our lives and those that we love? So we consider this and confront it. I remember um, looking through some pictures uh, years and years ago. Our first daughter might have been seven or eight years old. And as we're looking at the pictures, it was a picture of Chris and I. And we had been married six years before we had kids. And so we, the two of us were there. And Jen says, where was I? And, and I, said, I said, well, Jen, you weren't. And she said, I wasn't what? She couldn't grasp the concept that there was a time that the world, the universe, all the operations that are going on could have actually been happening before she got here. As far as she knew, it, it all kind of began with her, and in effect, in some ways, it would end with her. We have this expectation that, uh, that we will live forever. Uh, do you believe that? I can prove it to you right now that you thought you are going to be living forever. And that's because not one of you, raise your hand proudly if you woke up this morning and said, oh, holy mackerel, I got another day. I can't believe this. Did, did anybody wake up that way? Were you not expecting it? I mean, when you went to bed last night, did you just say, hon, see you in the morning? Or, or you had that, oh, tomorrow's church, I'm going to get it. Isn't that what you were thinking? You, you do understand you've probably thought that way every day for your entire life. You do understand that you're going to be thinking that the day before the day that it happens. It happens. I mean, we get so used to life. We've had it our whole lives. And we just expect it to be there. And we're surprised when it isn't. When some doctor says, whoa. You know, what do you mean, whoa? What does that mean? Give me a, give me a, a, a lay down. On what, what, what do you mean, whoa? So, I mean, you know, I had a heart attack, and, and uh, you know, I was struggling with that, and, and, and I start reading about the history of what they went through to try to get through this blockage that was 99% blocked. I, I mean, I was running all over the place, as I normally do, doing my own thing day after day after day, and sitting there with uh, a uh, right coronary artery blocked 99%. Is that number phase you at all <laughs> kind of phased me a little bit 99 percent, and and you know and 11 wires to break through it and and i'm reading why well, in the world i met the cardiologist i said what he said well <clears throat> i was likely there since you were a teenager mm, 
not, well, yeah, I was a really fat teenager. I didn't exercise. I was 185 pounds as a teenager. I had a German mother who, you know, it was like second to prayer was eating <clears throat> every night, all the stuff. Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> so my whole life, really. So I look at my Apple Watch. I mean, that was the thing that said something's going on funny here because it was 40. And I went to look. And you wouldn't remember, but I actually looked back in my history, and the week before my heart attack, uh, I was in Dallas. I was sitting at a convention in the morning, just relaxing while listening. You know, I wasn't dozing off, but I w it was nothing really like, are you kidding me? I was just sitting there relaxing, and as I looked at the history on my Apple Watch and my heart rate, in the middle of one of those mornings, my heart rate went to 36. <laughs> Do you have any idea? That's like on your way out. <laughs> I didn't know. I, I really. I mean, that, that makes sense. You know, normally yours right now, you check it, it's about 60, maybe 70, depending on your shape. 36. And I'm just sitting there innocently, you know, thinking what's for lunch. You know, I don't know. How do you keep in mind this reality that we are terminally ill, that we are dying? And that God said, this is connected to a sin, a separation from him, a less than perfect connection. For as Paul says, the wages of sin is death, which ought to surprise us when we got up this morning. Because we also confess today that we have been in bondage to sin. We cannot free ourselves. So we're going through life affected by the sins of others and our own sin. Jesus knows us well. Out of your heart, I know exactly what's going on in there. Every kind of evil thought and murmurs and all the rest. Oh my gosh, he goes through describing it like, who would die for somebody like that? Exactly his question. Jesus has come into the world because of the challenge we have that we are terminally ill, that we have decided that we could live apart from his will. Make our word the significant word. Our decision about good and evil. So we look at the small child miraculously made by God and we thank God and that is absolutely to be done. But we also need to look at the child and at each other and recognize there is a time. As Ecclesiastes would say, a time to live and a time to die. When Jesus is confronted by these two issues going on in his day and age, the question in everyone's mind, why did they die? Why did those at the Tower of Siloam die? I mean, was it, if we could just identify what they did, maybe the issue was um, taking uh, and working for the Romans. They were building an aqueduct, and, and, and they died. So maybe the moral of the story is do not build the aqueduct for the Romans. And if we avoid that, then we're okay. Maybe that's the issue. Or, or those that uh, had their blood mingled, the, the Galileans had their blood mingled with the sacrifices. What did they do? If we could just avoid that, we could bring order. We could straighten out chaos. We could end death for ourselves. If we just simply avoid what they did. The reality of it is, of course, Jesus' response points us in another direction. Do you think they were worse offenders than all the others? That, that there are grades of sin, and if you trip over that one, then you're on your way out? It is every day by grace, of course. Unless you repent, what will happen? You will perish? No. Not just perish, likewise perish. None of them sat there that day saying, oh yes, that's going to happen today. That I'm going to be crushed by a tower that falls. That I'm going to be taken by Pontius Pilate and uh, killed and have my blood mingled with the sacrifices. None of them were expecting that. It came upon them suddenly, and to die that way, looking in the wrong direction, having only plans for what is ahead. Not repenting. I mean, that's the key, Jesus says. Unless you repent, 
You're going to die in the same way they did. Well, what's the repentance? What, uh, I promise I won't sin anymore? That isn't going to work. Repentance has to do with a direction. Turn around. What would we look at? What would we go to? What would we see? Unless you repent, you will perish in the same way. Likewise, as they did. But if you turn, you will live. What do we see when we look at Jesus? I mean, what's your image? You got a picture if somebody said, oh, you know, think about Jesus. What comes to mind for you? For me, I was a little kid, went up and down the same stairs for 18 years before I went off to college. And at the landing, uh, right there, you came up and then took a landing and went up this way. There was a picture of Jesus. Anybody have that one? It's the one. I wouldn't suggest it. Don't get it for your grandkids or something because it's scared of bejeebers out. His eyes follow you. Anybody else seen that? I'm serious. I'm, don't, don't you laugh. That was a sky. You know, go to bed, you ratting kid. You know, and I go upstairs and there's Jesus following me with his eyes. Oh, oh my God, he saw it again. You know, not a go. Well, what, what's your image? What comes to mind? Now it's changed over the years. I'm, I got over that kind of. Anyway, any, how about the cross? Is that not the symbol? Is it not Christ? When you visualize the love of God that comes to us in Christ, focuses us on the cross. There he is with his arms out, nailed to the cross. And what he describes is when you see me, you are seeing the Father. And he preached this parable uh, about this son who wasted and, and ran away and he was like he was dead. And then his father is waiting the whole time with his arms outstretched, waiting for his son who is dead to come to life, who is blind to see him. God is waiting for us to repent, to turn from death, this short ended, to life, to live our lives in him, as St. Paul describes it. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So he's in jail and he's singing hymns of praise. He's protecting the jailer. He's, he's uh, getting stoned and shipwrecked and all the rest of it. And at the same time, offering praise to God. I thank you for the opportunity I have to make confession before these people who are beating the crap out of me. I mean, really, that's what he's saying. What does he understand about his relationship to the Father through Christ? He believed. He believed. He believed that When Jesus said, nothing can snatch you from the Father's hands. Nothing can snatch you from my hands. When he heard the word that Jesus in the night when he's betrayed took the Passover meal and said, this is my body for you, he believed. He believed that nothing could separate him or us from that love of God in Christ Jesus. Not life or death. It will come. Our days are numbered. Three score and ten, four score. If it comes earlier, we are surprised. If it comes later, we are disappointed as well. We don't want death. Jesus says, repent. Turn to me. I am the resurrection and the life. So, there at Bethany, his good friend Lazarus dies. Odd story in some ways, I suppose, but pertinent. Lazarus is dying. They send a messenger. He gets to Jesus and he says, Quick, your friend Lazarus is dying. Do something about this. Come. And you remember what Jesus did. He stayed there two more days. And then he saunters in only to find out that Lazarus has been dead. How long? In the tomb, four days. So how's that timing work? A messenger takes a day, gets to Jesus. He waits two days. Jesus takes, you know, a day, goes 15, 20 miles from where he is to Bethany. When did Lazarus die? Before the messenger ever got to Jesus. He had died. The reality is death. I can bring Lazarus back to life. I can call a dead guy out of the tomb. But sooner or later, Lazarus will die again and again and again until you recognize this shell is going to be left behind. The life I have for Lazarus is a new life. And I must go to the cross and die for his sins and your sins. And when I do, then you will have a life 
that is eternal. If you eat of my body and drink of my blood, if you believe in me, you will never die. The repentance is to turn and look at the loving Savior who promised that nothing will separate us from that love of the Father. So where is God's love in the midst of life and death? He is there, present in the coming of Christ, the one who promised he would never let us go. And so, so what do we do with the time that we have left and these short years that are ours? What would we do with them? Well, Jesus says there was a story like this. A man went and planted a fig tree. Now, the reason he planted a fig tree is he was expecting some production. He was expecting fruit to come from that. So I got to go because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit won't come. But if the Holy Spirit comes, this power from on high will bring you faith and fruit. You will be my witnesses by what you do. How will those poor in Peru know God cares at all? What will affirm the words of the pastor who preaches to them God's love in Jesus Christ? Will it be because some strange, distant group of people send enough money for their child to go to school? Every day that sermon will be preached to that child and from that child to his classmates. Where did you get your uniform? Or to his parents, thanks be to God that you're able to go to school. That's what we do with our time. We let that fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, let that be the center of our lives. To be lived in Christ, to be lived in joy. I pray the Lord would bless you and me as we repent and turn and see the one on the cross who loved us enough to die for us and give us a life that is eternal. I pray that for us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a few moments to meditate on the Word and the will of God.